Hello, everybody. So we'll just do a little introduction to start. My name is Marion Emmerich. I'm manager of Youth and Community Services for the Huntington's Disease Society of America. And you're also from an HD family. Oh, and I'm also from an HD family. So my mom passed away around 12 years ago from Huntington's disease. So I have many different hats. Um, after my mom passed, I sort of dove in head first as a volunteer. Um, and then luckily I now work for HDSA and I honestly can say that I don't work a day in my life. So. I'm Jessica Marsalek. I'm a social worker. I work in the States in Minnesota. I'm the chapter social worker there and then I work in the, the Midwest as a youth worker. And I've worked with Huntington's families now for 16 years. And uh, my family and I volunteer as well um, to support in any way that we can. So today we are going to be talking about uh, preparing for genetic testing. A lot of times you'll see genetic genetic counselors doing these sessions, but we're social workers by trade, so we're not going to get into the nitty-gritty of genetic testing, but we're going to be having a discussion about um, some things for you to consider. And I hope that you don't walk away from this feeling like we're telling you what to do at all, or that we, we don't should on you at all today. We don't want to be telling you what you should and shouldn't do. This is just a, an overview, a very high-level overview of the genetic testing process and some things for you to think about as you're considering this for yourself or in discussion about it. So if every, was everybody in or a lot of people in the Ask the Experts um, discussion just before? So this was definitely mentioned a lot, right? There's no right decision. It's your right decision. It's the right decision for you. Everybody's path is different. Everybody's process is going to be different. And we just want to make sure we emphasize that, OK? And like Jessica said, we just want to make sure that you're educated and feel empowered and empowered to in advocate for yourself during this process, okay, and making that decision. But there's no right decision. Um, just as Jessica said, I'm a family member and uh, when I went through my testing process, initially I was like, I'm never getting tested and then dove in and wanted to get tested right away by myself and then it took me a few years to go through that process. And that was my process. That doesn't mean that it's your process or somebody else's. Okay. So I know we're an international con conference, so that means there's many different ways to go through the genetic testing process. So we are going to do a very like overview of what that process can look like and just know that that process can be different for everybody. That doesn't mean just because you're in a different country, um, but it's depending on who you feel comfortable with um, and how what you need for support, okay? So whether that's with your primary or with a genetic counselor or with an HD-specific clinic, okay? So we just want to make sure that all ways are the right way if that's your way, okay? And that was a great segue in our conversation just before this session. There was a lot of great uh, conversations and things that came up in that discussion. So. You might hear a little bit of that, but it was a great segue to, a, to this conversation. And hopefully at the end, we'll have a few minutes to have a little dialogue as well. So genetic testing is a biochemical way of determining the presence of a particular gene of an individual. Um, I think like one of the panelists said, it's something that you're born with. Um, and so it's not like it's something that just is found out that you have just because um, at the time of the gene testing. but is something that you've always had, um, but the HD gene is a variation of a gene that everyone has. The variation involves the expanded CAG repeat. So somebody that does not, um, isn't from an HD family or does not have the risk um, would have a, a typical length of that CAG repeat. Somebody that may or may not develop HD would have an expansion. It's a blood test or a saliva test. It determines whether they have the gene and there are limitations to it. A couple of them, um, it doesn't determine when the symptoms will start, and it doesn't determine what they'll be like. Everybody with Huntington's is very unique in their, their experience of it, their symptom, you know, symptomatic, um, when they get the symptoms, if they, how they get the symptoms. There's a lot of commonalities, but everyone's experience is very different. One sibling can be different than another. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in the next slide we'll talk about two, but there's also the gray area. So, so somebody could have a negative test, which means they will not develop HD and they will not pass it on. Um, both genes would cont contain a CAG repeat in the normal range. Uh, HD positive is that at some point in their life, they will develop symptoms of HD 
and that would be a repeat of over 40 in their, in their gene tests. And then there's also the gray area, which when I started working in Huntington 16 years ago, that wasn't even a known thing. Um, and so that is probably in the last seven or eight years that that's um, been known. But the gray area, I feel like that's like the worst place you'd have to, like that would be really hard because you go through the testing process and you're still on the fence. So the gray area means you may or may not develop symptoms of HD. It's not a definitive answer. So it's between 36 and 39 is called reduced penetrance, um, that some will develop HD, some will not. Intermittent alleles, which is the 27 to 35, they will not themselves develop HD, but their offspring, offspring may. So it's a really, it's, it's this gray area that I feel like if you go in for the testing, you want one or the other, and it, it kind of puts you in the, still on the fence. Still on that unknown, yes, like what's yeah, gonna happen, yeah. yeah. The gray area, uh, it's mean that uh, they will, if they will uh, be sick, it's later than 40? So statistically, so, like if we look at um, data, like Lauren had said earlier, um, that yes-ish, sometimes you'll see a later onset for that gray area on average, not always. That doesn't mean you could be in the gray area, have a CAG repeat of 37 or 39, let's say, um, and then start developing symptoms in that average onset age between 40 and 50 years old as well, or even younger or older. And to clarify the gray area, that doesn't necessarily mean you will develop symptoms. You could or you could not. Be. Yeah. yeah. So it does mean, though, when you're in that gray area, right, that if you were to then have a child, your child is still has a 50-50 chance, and the gene can then still expand. Okay. When you're in that gray area, do you lifestyle factors such as alcohol and drugs? into a part if you will develop it or not? So I think in any area it will impact, right? It's in just general, HD or no HD, um, lifestyle choices. You know, exercise and food and things like that are really important in general. Um, there's no definite research that shows that it either prolongs the progression or the onset of symptoms, um, but of course it's just a healthier lifestyle, it's always better for, um, in regards to HD as well. I'm not aware, I'm not aware of any research around that. Okay. Any other questions about the gray, and again, we're not genetic counselors or geneticists, so um, any questions that we can't answer, we're happy to find out, okay? Okay, so this process, as was mentioned earlier in, in the previous session, can look very different in different places, right? So this process is yours, and we wanna make sure that you can advocate for yourself and understand what this process can look like and what you need, and what you know to need for your support for yourself during this process. The most important is you are the expert, right? And remember that. Um, and I know that's been said over and over again, but it's really true with whether it's for yourself or for your loved one, okay? So this process is usually, could be anywhere from, usually the, the blood sample takes about six weeks to receive. So even if on the day of receiving that blood sample, it takes about four to six weeks. So it goes from at least that time period to can be as long as you need. And like I shared earlier, you know, I went in thinking like I wanted to get my blood drawn that day and I ended up taking, I was like, you know what, I'm good. I don't need to know right now. And I waited a year and then I went back and then I waited six months and then I went back and forth with myself because I wasn't ready, right? So that process was very different. So in the States we have, and I know around the world, there's different HD specific clinics, seeing a social worker, a genetic counselor, a psychiatrist, a neurologist, right? And you oftentimes at least see the genetic counselor at least two times, I would say, on average, um, just to make sure that you're ready to handle whatever results you might get, right? Um, and that's really just to support you. It's not because they have to go through this process 
but it's because they want to make sure you're in the right place mentally, physically, and you have the right support in place as well. Okay? No, I did not go over any of that, but basically. And also, if you decide, because some people feel more comfortable with like their family doctor um, or somebody that they know that might not be an HD specific, education can be provided to anyone, right? So if you feel comfortable with your primary physician, the education could be provided by any kind of nonprofit um, social worker or um, physician or provider. I have a question um, from the US. Uh, my sister wanted to get tested. They denied her because they said she was mentally unstable with that. And then it came out she has a different condition that's also part of Huntington's. Um, is that a legal thing? Can, can the U.S. do that? So depending on the so the states are fun um, with healthcare, <laughs> right? Um, so it's not necessarily that anybody can deny. Um, it's your it's her right to get tested, right? The thing is if she's ready, if there's psychiatric issues, like I know for someone in my family, they were denied as well. Um, so they went to their primary and went and got tested um, because they didn't agree with that. Um, so it's not that it's illegal, but it's just that they as medical providers can say that. Um, and it goes from an institution to institution basis. It's not necessarily on a whole. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's um, um, I just lost my train of thought. Sorry. Um, when you go to your primary care physician to get tested, do they still do the counseling there? No. So usually they could refer you externally to a genetic counselor, um, and you could advocate for that, right? If you want to have that discussion with your primary physician or anybody that you're going through this process with. It could be a regular neurologist or psychiatrist. Usually it's a neurologist that needs to, um, depending, sorry, I'm very US um, for knowledge wise um, for this process, but um, they, you, would, you could ask and request. So this is like, you know, if you, which is really important to speak to a genetic counselor to talk about like, what if positive, what if negative, what are all these different factors that you want to speak about and have these discussions around. Um, so if they don't refer you, because sometimes primaries don't understand, sometimes neurologists that aren't specializing in Huntington's disease don't understand and don't know. So telling them like, I need to speak to a genetic counselor, um, you know, that's advocating for yourself, right? They're, they might not be the ones to do that. Yeah, um, and that's VA is a, yeah. Um, sometimes you get like emails from a primary, like just doesn't, or just give them a call like, yeah, you're good, you're in the clear, or you know, things that you don't realize, like for somebody that's not impacted directly, doesn't realize the impact of how those results are being discussed with you and being given to you, um, how important that is. Um, so that's why like advocating and saying like, I need more support. I need to seek out therapy, um, a social worker, another genetic counselor, whatever it might be, but not knowing that process. A lot of times people don't know they might be at risk and going through this process and don't know what's available to them. And generally a, a, a general practice doctor isn't going to be familiar with Huntington's disease. And so I've had, I've worked with families that have asked for the test from their GP and they've gotten like a postcard in the mail saying, by the way, you have Huntington's disease. Like, yeah as if you would have high blood pressure. Like that's, I'm not gonna say we should, you should or shouldn't, but that was really hard for that family okay. and to have that knowledge to share with them in the mailbox and then what? Like they, had, they now have that knowledge. They never had a chance to think about positive, negative, you know, like what am I, what's this gonna look like for me? So taking that time to speak with somebody, a professional even once or twice about what, what does that mean for me one way or the other? Um, and what does that mean for my family, my future? What, what does that mean? I'm gonna click over because that's sort of discussions to have with yourself, your family, your support system, the people that you're going through this uh, process with. You keep going. Sorry. <laughs> uh, there is a 
Medical records, yeah, so anonymous testing. I don't know how it is internationally in different countries, um, but there is anonymous testing um, able to be done. Uh, you just have to ask that institution or provider if, it's, if you're able to. The only conflict that I've, I know of is that if you get anonymous testing and you're positive, um, you have to get tested again so that it is in your, your medical record so that eventually when you need to get social security disability, then you have that medical record to show that you have the disease and you need disability. So at least in the States, it would have to be done again. So if that makes sense. Um, yeah. So some things to like think about, right? Yeah. To have those discussions about like life insurance, healthcare insurance, right? Thinking about that before going through that process, because you know, I know for like life insurance and any kind of private um, insurance companies, if you test positive for the gene expansion, they will deny you, and they're allowed to deny you insurance. Um, healthcare is different around the world, um, so and there's laws in place to protect you, but specifically for life insurance, um, any kind of long-term care insurance, any kind of uh, long-term caregiving, uh, that could be impacted with a test result. Can, um, if you're already insured, like I'm a teacher, so I have a lot of this insurance already, mm -hmm. but if that test result comes out positive, can my insurance providers drop me? No. Not while you're employed, yeah. but at the point of which you may need those policies, you may not be working. So it's sometimes important to weigh having your employee benefit, insurance benefits as well as having some standalone benefits. It's, it's sometimes worthwhile. And then also not missing payments because they're really good at dinging you and not paying for what they have to pay for because they're, yeah. they're not a business to, you know, yeah, different they serve insurance. themselves, let's just say yeah. that. So, you know, thinking about that, having that conversation with a provider or support um, to see like what's available to you prior to testing. Um, a lot of times, unfortunately in the States, like, you know, I remember going through uh, trying to get life insurance and I got denied um, three times uh, because one, I walked in with like a broken arm. They're like, you're going to cost us money. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I probably will. But um, I also, um, you know, they denied me because they were like, why are you so young going, getting life insurance, right? Um, so finding and different places offer different things. So finding that right, but if you are to go through the testing process, getting that prior to going through that, it's important. Okay. And one thing when going through the, the questioning for these insurances, it's one thing um, I've heard that if, if they ask you if you have Huntington's disease and you've never been tested, to your knowledge, you do not. Mm -hmm. And so you legally can say no, because to your knowledge, you do not. If they ask if it's in your family, that's one thing. But you can't lie, because then they'll also try and ding you once you try to recover that yeah. policy. Yeah. So um, once less you've been is more tested, Once that. you've been tested, you know. Yeah. When you haven't been tested, you do not know, and you do not have it, to your knowledge. Yeah. So less is more. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have to disclose unless they ask, right, like by law. But, um, yeah, don't lie either. Like, don't want to say to lie, but you know, if they don't ask, that's not my problem, right? Um, and they can they can deny you, and it's not just Huntington's; it's other types yeah, of medical family histories as well. So they can deny you, and and don't try not to take it personally. Like you're a bad person. It's yeah. it's other other diseases and other um, people get denied as well. But yeah, it might take you a few times to get an insurance. Any other questions around insurance? can answer one-on-one -on -one too as well. I think a lot of times when you get jobs, jobs come with health insurance or like life insurance. So would that also, people could deny you jobs because of this? So they won't necessarily ask for like medical history. So you don't have to necessarily disclose, you know, um, it's so tough. You know, I, I think we were having this conversation earlier about like wanting to empower ourselves, right? And breaking down that stigma of talking about it but also remembering to protect yourself is really important as well. Um, so you could advocate for yourself and also protect yourself at the same time, right? I know people that have been in jobs for 20 plus years and they you know, decided to share about HD and then 
started getting like red flags on their records because they just, even though they might not have been going through the testing process or even had been tested, but had um, just it was like a red flag for their employer. Um, so depending on that relationship and where you where you work, would depend on that. Um, but health insurance wise, no. It depends on your career too. I think you know if you have a job that people's lives are at risk. You know, there's some jobs that might ask you some of that medical question. They might have a class of a license that you need to have, but you don't need to share that information on the front end. Some people have had really positive experiences sharing with their coworkers, their supervisors, that HDs in their family, they've felt really supported. Some people have not. Um, so it kind of depends on, on the job. But yeah, they, they oftentimes do provide insurances. Uh, but like I said, at the point where you may need that type of insurance, like long-term care, um, or life insurance, um, it may not be a time you're working. And sometimes so. checking with your employer is really important because there are policies that you might not be aware of. They might not automatically put you in, like life insurance and long-term care and stuff like that. And it's a lot easier sometimes to go through your employer because there's not like that whole process of finding. Um, and they sometimes, not always, but sometimes will do, um, not do the in-depth that they usually do as a private agency. Take advantage of what you do. But that's, you know, asking your employer, asking HR and things like that. Um, so some discussions to have, whether that's with your provider, your support network, and remember, um, like the experts earlier had said, like, you're not in this alone. You don't have to go through this alone. Let that person that maybe your sibling or a family member or a close friend People in this room that you meet this weekend or people you've met in the community over years, um, let them make that decision if they want to be there for you. Don't assume that, they, that it's going to be a burden. They want to, people that care for you um, will probably, I would say, 95% of the time want to be there for you, okay? Um, and that support person and that support network could be anyone. It doesn't have to be family, okay? Your given family or your chosen family. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, so things to think about, right, and discussions to have with that support, with those healthcare providers, with that genetic counselor are, you know, what if the test is positive? What if it's negative? What if it's in the gray area? Um, what are your coping skills that you go through that process as well? You know, we were talking, I was talking with somebody earlier about, you know, that waiting period that someone had mentioned earlier as well um, is probably some of the hardest, the hardest time through this entire process. It's just that waiting period. It's like the longest six weeks of your life, right? Um, so what are different ways that you could cope and, you know, whether that's writing or running or whatever gives you some sort of level of peace, okay? Um, finding that support network or support person, who would that be? You know, a lot of times providers or any process that you might go through, you, they're going to require you to have somebody with you no matter what that test result is. So who is that person gonna be? Okay, um, and thinking about that as well and talking to multiple people about that. Um, the impact of whatever your test result or your process, what that will be on other family members and what's your timing for the test, you know, and what you need is right. It says alternative to testing, what do you mean with that? I so if you, so let's say you are doing it because you want to have children, right? Um, is it, if that's the only reason and you don't really want to know your gene status, right? Um, there is IVF, there's adoption, there's different alternatives to having, going through that testing process if that's your only reason. Every person has a different reason for why they want to go through the testing process. And if that's yours, if there's a way that you don't need to and don't want to, then that's an alternative. Mm -hmm. Can you adopt if you have HD? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Sort of so, I know many people that have adopted, mm -hmm. um, being uh, having HD, um, the gene expansion, non symptomatic. Um, it is difficult as a single person, just in general, to go through it, adoption. Um, but I, so I've had heard some difficulties about going through the adoption process as a single individual um, with the HD expansion. So that would be the only like um, one that I would say if it's 
more if it's on your record and it, you, when you're going through that process if, if it's axed. But that's a general like. Okay. But otherwise, yes, absolutely. Yeah, and my husband and I adopted um, children eight years ago, and we don't have HD in our family, but we have other medical things, and so in that process, it's very they dive into like your family history and. And we did need a letter from a doctor saying that, you know, we could adopt. But, you know, it's, it is something where they dive into your everything to get to know you. So you do, it does come out. It is something that they want to learn about. Um, it may be something that you need a professional to just say, hey, you know, this doesn't impact their ability to be parents um, any more than anything else, right? So it is possible. But it might be a conversation. And I think that's also like, yeah, um, just speaking on that, if you're going to an HD specific clinic, let's say, having that relationship with them to know like, just because you know you might have HD, doesn't mean you're gonna be, you can't be a parent, right? Or you can't do anything you want in this, right? Mm -hmm. And having that relationship to you know advocate for yourself and they could advocate for you as well if needed. Adoption's a great option. Yeah. <laughs> and for those based in England or Wales, um, I'm a youth worker for the HD8, if anyone wants to have a chat uh, and they're thinking about testing, come and see me after this one. Appreciate it. Thank you so Thank much. You. Okay. So thinking about your why is really important. Why you're thinking about getting tested. Right? So there's different, these are just examples. There's so many other reasons. Sometimes it's just a gut feeling. Some people are like, find out about HD. Their you know, parent has it from a young age that you know about it. And you're like, as soon as I turn 18, I want to go to the doctor and get tested. And that's just like, they want to plan. And that's the type of person that they are. And that's OK. Um, some people are doing it for family planning reasons. Some want to know about like, do I go to school for 12 years to become a doctor? Or am I going to start experiencing symptoms like right after I finish school and still owe a million dollars, right? Um, so there's different reasons for why people do that for school planning or career planning. Um, people do it for financial reasons. People do it for quality of life. And some people do it for because family pressure. A lot of times I meet a lot of people that, unfortunately, you know, they find out HD's in their, um, their parent has it and their family's like, you have to get tested and they're pressured to do that, right? To find out. So then I guess they get some sort of relief or they want to plan for them. Um, just remember that this is your decision and your choice and your process. Okay. I've also seen people feel pressure within relationships. So if they're in like romantic relationships with somebody that there, there is some pressure that could be, um, within that as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember um, the first time I realized, so my mom was symptomatic my whole life and found out she had HD when I was nine and uh, my high school uh, person was like, you know, when we get married, like I was gonna marry him, but um, <laughs> he was like, when we get married, you have to test. And I was like, my mom had me without, um, testing, like I'm going to do the same thing, right? Um, I deserve to be here. Anybody else deserves to be here. So I remember that was the first time someone was just like that I was at risk. And I like the process in my head, I was just like, wait a second. I just assumed I had it that whole time. Like I just didn't even know that there was a question of if I could have it. And it was the first time somebody actually approached me with that conversation. And I mean, I was so gung ho of not. And then um, things changed. But and it's okay to be up and down. It's okay to think you want to get tested and then, you know, decide not to. You know, for me, like I said, I started that process all by myself. And I went to the same genetic counselor that my mom had gone to and my uncles had gone to. And they were like, Marion, you need someone. We know your whole family, too, so this is awkward. Um, but I was like, no, I don't want to do it with anyone. Um, and they respected that. And then I, you know, decided to go back to school because um, I had dropped out and um, was going down a really bad path and uh, had to be hospitalized. But then I was like, you know what, I'm doing better. I don't need to know. And I stopped. And that's okay. And there's very, most providers, as long as you communicate that with them, they're very supportive of that. Okay. Anything else you want to add? One of the, I was just going to add one of the discussions that we had when we were talking about this topic is that 
when people learn about Huntington's disease, um, even Marianne on the flight over was talking to the person next to her and the first question she sometimes gets is, um, are you gonna be tested or do you have it or not? I, I don't know if anyone else has experienced that, but people are really curious. Um, I'm just curious if anyone, how do you respond to that? Like that's one of the things we were discussing is like, it's a very personal choice, but if you don't, if you don't know much about Huntington's, you're just learning about it and they say those comments, like what is something, how do you respond to that? Is there any way that you found that is helpful to kind of stop their conversation, like, <laughs> but also respect your, your needs? Yeah, I have a coworker who's very curious about Huntington's. Um, because she thinks, it came out later on, that uh, she thinks her husband's father has it. Mm. And um, that was something that she's never experienced before. And so she had all the questions and she kept, and she's very blunt. And um, that's why she's my friend outside of work as well. <laughs> she was very much like, well, you should get tested, right? And I said, well, let me, re I just correct her. Like, Let's rephrase it. I should do what I need to do to protect my own mental health right now. And at this point in time, I'm considering it, but I do want to do more research before I commit. Yeah. And that's usually how I redirect it, uh, because I know it comes from a place of, with her sincerity and concern. Mm -hmm. um, she's just very brash about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love the way you put that, though. I really like the way you put that. I wish I had you on the plane, because I was like, uh, I don't know what to say. <laughs> Meanwhile, I've been talking about this. I'm like, thank you so much for asking what the HD is, and thank God we have a five-hour flight. Yes. So I can go into great detail. Um, but then once those questions and like asking about every single family member, I like still freeze, and I just don't know what to say. And I'm like, ah, oh, my boundaries are so bad. Um. <laughs> and, and I've seen the people ask questions of others. But I've also, when I'm, teach, when I'm talking about Huntington's, I'm not personally affected. So when, I, when I'm teaching about it and talking about it with anyone I talk to, they're, they're curious and they ask me the questions, but I can talk about people in general and like what, you know, not everyone gets tested. It's, you know, to some people it's like, why wouldn't they? Well, there's a lot of things to consider here. And so, so I, I just, I've seen it happen where it's like, the questions come and you're like. <laughs> yeah, just... in shock that some people have like no filter. <laughs> Do you wanna... So we are, we are out of time, um, so I want to be respectful of that, but yeah. if you guys are okay with just a couple more slides of just a couple of discussion or questions, if that's okay? okay? So what may be some reasons that someone would get tested? Are there, are there any other reasons besides some of the things we've shared? I don't know. It's just because I always think about it mm -hmm. when I do something. Let's say I forget about something, I, I would be like, oh, it's because of that. But every person forgets things. But, you know, in my head, it's because of that, and I start worrying, and I just feel like it's a burden on me, yeah. to be honest. Yeah. So if it's preoccupying your thoughts a lot, if it's impacting your daily life, if it's something that you're always, always thinking about, I, I have known people that really find relief in knowing if that's something that's preoccupying their thoughts all the time. For sure. Any other reason why you guys? I'm the clumsiest person in the entire world. Um, <laughs> people, so I, just to disclose, I'm doing an, another session later on survivor's guilt. I tested negative. Um, and, you know, people still are like, are you sure that test isn't wrong? Because <laughs> <laughs> I am forgetful. I drop things all the time. Like, even if, we symptom hunt constantly, mm -hmm. you know, being directly impacted, even with um, a test result, no matter what that is, right? And just because you might be clumsy or forgetful, um, you know, or stressed or experience different mental health issues as well, that doesn't mean that's HD either, right? Um, so just remember that, that, you know, we're constantly symptom hunting. Um, mm -hmm. So just to wrap up, a few things just to remember, this is your process. Um, you know, focus on what you need and what you want during this process and during just like thinking about going through the testing process. You can stop at any moment and change your mind and that's okay. And you could stay at risk forever and that's okay too, right? Um, make sure you 
find that support circle, being here. You're just like Matt said earlier, you are so courageous and brave just being here. And this is the first step into so many new relationships and this community. And I can't say it enough, but like, we're going to learn a lot this weekend, right? And we're going to find a lot of support. But the most important is the relationship between each other that you're going to take from this. Okay. Um, and it's okay to still not know if you want to and continue. Okay. And we're here if you want to chat after or throughout the weekend or forever, honestly. Okay. Thank you guys so much. Thank you.